Thank you, brother. It's good to be here. All right. Well, listen, about um, five years ago, I was down in Kentucky, and at Mount Vernon, Kentucky, actually, and was um, in the pulpit, and I was still in the introduction of my message, and all of a sudden, I got dizzy. And I said, just a minute, folks, I'm a little bit dizzy. And then five seconds later, I was on the floor. And they took me to the hospital, and I didn't know whether I was going to die or live. And um, the, the whole church came to the altar when I went out to the hospital to pray for me. And uh, it was what was wrong is my blood pressure. And the thing is, is once you have that problem, you kind of sense when there's something not exactly right. And uh, anyway, that's why I wasn't standing up while we were singing. I always stand up whenever everybody else stands up and so on. I just uh, feel just a little bit woozy. And so I'm okay, but don't worry about it too much. But uh, uh, if, I, uh, if I die in the pulpit, then that's okay because I'm saved. Amen. I'm going to heaven. Amen. And... Uh, and that would uh, probably be better than my wife being here watching it happen. So she's not here tonight. And, uh, but anyway, uh, God is good and God's wonderful no matter what happens, whether you live or whether you die and so on. And, and um, I believe that I'm going to be okay. I feel fine right at this, this second, so praise the Lord. Uh, I'd like to say that you all have been so kind to me. It's always wonderful to visit your church and, and your preacher and his wife. They've been good friends of ours for years and years and years, probably over 40 years, really. Uh, it goes all the way back to the early 70s, like 1973, 72. Yeah, right in there is when we first heard about each other and probably met about then. But we were, you know, back then nobody had any money. Either they didn't and we didn't. And you didn't do very much out of town uh, very often, and so we didn't go visit each other and things like that uh, during those years, but we prayed for each other. I prayed for Brother Dunbar and Brother Keck way back in the 70s, early 70s, when they were getting that work started up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and, and praise the Lord for Brother Dunbar. And I remember when I came to New York and found out that Brother Dunbar was here, I, I met him at Indiana at Fairhaven Baptist College there, and uh, at a preaching conference, and he was going to preach at Southeast Bible Baptist Church, brother, uh, it's Brother Crone's church now, but uh, uh, he was going to preach there in about a couple of weeks, and I was coming to New York, and I said, wonderful, I want to hear you preach. Praise the Lord. And uh, man, I made it an effort to get here and to, Wisconsin, to New York and get over there to Southeast and heard him preach. And I was blessed and thank God for, for your preacher. Uh, and, uh, you know, I appreciate being able to go to his home and he had a nice room all made up there, him and his wife, and, uh, for me already to relax and had a refrigerator in there and... Uh, uh, and it had uh, some ice water in it and whatever and some uh, some kind of uh, raspberries. Oh, well, it had some raspberries in there yes ma'am and then it had a, a can of uh, something uh, what mango seltzer. oh mango, mango seltzer I didn't try that uh, but it, it's, it was in there and but they did all those things because they care for the preacher and I appreciate it so much. They've been, they've been so kind to me. And God bless you as a church also. I, I've been looking forward to uh, coming here for a long time. I'd called Brother Dunbar several times over the years. And uh, we've uh, never been able to arrange the right time. Because I've, uh, you know, some, some evangelists plan two or three years ahead. I've never done that. And I plan... Uh, two or three months maybe ahead, something like that. And this time it worked out, praise the Lord, for me to be able to come. And I'm glad that I'm here. And I pray that God will bless you tonight. It's good to see you two men back there visiting tonight. I pray that God will bless you this evening and speak to your heart. Uh, you want to take a look at the book table because after the service is over, when it all 
cleaners up and so on. I'm not in a hurry, but uh, whenever you're all finished uh, looking at everything, then I'll pack it all up and, and put it in the car and whatever. But uh, we'll be here after the services if you want to, want to get something. I might mention that if you teach any classes or preach or whatever, you might want to get a copy. There's four different uh, object lesson books back there on the table, and it's just filled full of things that you can use as object lessons when you're teaching or preaching. You know, people remember a lot of what they hear and see better than just what they hear. And so if you're able to use an object lesson, it's really good. My son-in-law, Scott Hanks, he uses an object lesson in probably 90 percent of the time that he preaches. Um, and, the, and he wrote all these materials back there in the back. Uh, the object lesson books he did not write, but the rest of the things back there he did write. Um, there's four, bo or four books back there on the family. Uh, one is The Ingredients of a Mother. Another one is The Ingredients of a Father. Uh, another one is The Soldiers of Jesus Christ, and another one about children. So there's four books on the home, and they're all great books and so on. I, I like this one on the mother because my daughter wrote some of it inside, and uh, my oldest daughter, her name is Stacia Fawn. And, uh, you know, the other day I wrote her, a, wrote her something, and I put uh, Stacia Bottrell. I, oh, whoops. Crossed out Bottrell and wrote Hanks. Uh, uh, but uh, she was Stacia Bottrell all the time that I was racing her. And so, but anyway, uh, she was married for um, 11 and a half years and hadn't had any children. She was praying that God would give her a child. She had prayed about that for a long time. And she sat down and she wrote a poem. Oh, Lord, here I am again, old empty arms, you know. The void just keeps growing despite life's busy flow. Sure, I get distracted, involved in the day to day, but I can't seem to find a thing to take the pain away. My heart so longs to trust you, and at times it's not so bad. But little things come along and remind me why I'm sad. Sometimes it's a passing cart with a baby seat in view. My heart is stretched with longing. Could I not have one too? Sometime it's that announcement, a new one's on the way, breath indrawn against the pain. Congratulations, I must say. Sometimes it's a story or a write-up in the news, a baby that's abandoned or sadly been abused. Dear Lord, I say, I'd never treat a child that way. I'd love him with all my heart and pray for him each day. You must have a reason, though I cannot see your plans, the comfort that you offer me surpasses any man's. Daily I ask you, Lord, to keep me in your will while longing for that little one, my empty arms to fill. Thirty days after she wrote that, she became expectant. After the baby was born, she wrote another poem. It's on the other page called Overflowing Arms. And these books are just filled full of stuff that'll, some of them will make you laugh, some of them will make you weep. I can hardly read that without, because she's my daughter. And my heart goes out to her, and I can sense it, and I can hardly read it without weeping. And so, anyway, there's some good things back there, and I say every Christian home needs some good materials in their home to read. Not only for your family, but when you have visitors. You don't want your visitors picking up something that's no good for them to look at while you're fixing the meal and doing stuff and whatever. You sure don't want to have anything like a People magazine laying around or stuff like that. You want to have something that'll help them. And you can get some of those little booklets back there and have them in your home and leave some of them in your living room for people to look at. And it, it'll help them. It'll help, and it'll help you as a Christian, you in your home. And, and everybody ought to have a lot of good Christian literature to be able to be a help in their homes. And uh, it's very reasonably priced. You won't find any literature anywhere that's less priced than what it is there. He barely, barely uh, makes, his, makes ends beats to pay for the stuff that he prints. Um, you know, uh, just like that, that uh, all of those 20 Walk in Truth series, for $40, $2 a piece, you can't copy them on a copy machine for that. 
And that's the truth. So anyway, they're very good price. There's one book back there that is just loaded. It's 370 pages. Every page has a Bible story on it of the Old Testament. If I said, how many Old Testament stories do you think they are? There are. You would have said, oh, a couple hundred maybe. But 370 he has there. I'm not sure that's all of them, but uh, that's how many are in, in that book. And that book would be a blessing to you, and it's very reasonably priced too. Turn to the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4 in your Bibles, please. And we want to read some selective verses out of this chapter because of time tonight. And uh, Brother Dunbar said, you have a couple of hours if you want it, you know, and whatever. And, uh, but uh, and so if you get tired, just close your eyes and take a nap and then come back whenever you wake up again. But anyway, um, I want to just, uh, and I'll tell you whenever we're going to skip a verse or two uh, while we're reading this. And we'll start with verse number four. And he must needs go through Samaria. That's the Lord Jesus wanted to go through Samaria. He went there on purpose. There was something he wanted to do. Verse number five. Now Jacob's well was there and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water and Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Verse um, nine. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew ask a drink of me, which am a woman uh, of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water." The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, and whence, from whence had, then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. I want you to notice that Jesus wants to get down where the rubber meets the road. He's wanting God to speak to her heart and her to get under conviction and so on. And so she said, the woman said, well, uh, I, uh, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and calleth to the men and come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified he told them me all, thing, all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of the same, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is, is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Lord Jesus, this may be the last time that I ever preach at Freedom Baptist Church. Only you know, Lord, and I pray that tonight would be a special night for everyone that's sitting here that you would speak to every heart, that you would meet every spiritual need here. Lord Jesus, please answer the needs tonight for Christ's sake. We thank you for this beautiful passage of scripture that we just read. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to everyone and meet, us, meet our needs, please. In Jesus' name, amen.
1895, there was a man that was born that became a Christian when he was a young man. And in 1934, he began a paper that most all of you would have heard of and is still being published. That paper is called The Sword of the Lord. Some of most, how many have ever heard of that paper? All right, about three fourths of you have. Okay. And uh, he was an evangelist and he traveled over the state of Texas and also into Oklahoma and different places preaching. And man, God was blessing him. He would preach and souls were getting saved and people were getting things right with God. Man, God was just, the windows of heaven had opened up in his ministry. But he had a problem. Most every song, I mean, most every uh, message that he would preach, he would weep. He had such a soft heart. If you've ever heard, how many have ever heard John R. Rice preach? All right, several of you have. I mean, when you, you, man, that guy had compassion when he preached. You could just tell, no matter what he preached on, you could see his heart was in it. And, uh, but he got embarrassed about his tears. And so he got on his knees and he prayed and he says, Lord, I'm embarrassed. Every time I get up and preach, I weep, Lord. Would you take away my tears so I won't be so embarrassed? God took away his tears. And he got up and he preached. But hardly anybody was coming to the altar to get saved. Hardly anybody was coming to the altar to get things right with God. And uh, he got embarrassed about that. And he said, oh God, I don't want to go through the rest of my life not having any results when I preach the word of God. Lord, would you, if, you, if I got to have my tears back in order to have results, God, give me my tears back. And bless God, God gave him his tears back. And God blessed him over a long ministry. And in 1972, I started a work in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I had been in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Was there almost three years. And God blessed our work there in Fond du Lac. And, and I was very green when I went to Fond du Lac. I, I started pastoring in 1969 in March. And I... Uh, had only been saved two weeks when I started pastoring. Uh, it's a long story to tell you how that happened, but that's the truth. So I went to Sheboygan, or Fond du Lac, and pastored, and they paid me a whopping salary of $10 a week. I was married and had two children. $10 a week. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I can't live on $10 a week, so I put $5 a week back in the offering. Can't live on 10 can't live on 5 either, so what's the difference? And so I was going to honor God with the first fruits of my increase. And I increased $10 a week. And I put five back in the offering. And folks, I could preach the rest of the message just telling you illustration after illustration of how God met our needs there in Fond du Lac on $10 a week. You would, you would not believe it. You would not. I mean, it's just beyond, beyond imagination. And you would probably wouldn't uh, believe it. Because, uh, but you'd almost have to live it to be able to understand it. Now... Brother Dunbar probably would believe it because I'm sure that he has some stories that are pretty similar uh, to, to the, this one. But then I, I was there and then God told me to resign this church and go to Sheboygan and start a church because there's a city over there of about 40 to 50,000 people and there's not a work there where anybody can get saved. You need to go over there and start a work. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. So I went over to Sheboygan and uh, man, God began to bless the church there immediately. The first Sunday was in August of 1972. We had 46 people came our first Sunday to church. I thought, wow. I mean, I didn't have a revival team that came to help me or it was just my wife and myself and my two little kids. And Man, it was amazing what God did there. And God had really blessed, and we were about six months old. We had a big day, and we had 180 in Sunday school in January, right after we started. I couldn't believe it, that God was blessing so much. And I was so green, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew how to knock on a door. 
I knew how to tell somebody about Jesus and God was just blessing so much. And I, I just couldn't believe it. But I was so green and I needed to hone up and figure out how to do things better. And I heard that they were having a Sword of the Lord conference in Watertown, Wisconsin. And I said, wow, they're having one of those over there. Maybe I can go to that and, and get some pointers that will help me to be a better preacher. And so I went over to Watertown to that Sword of the Lord conference. Dr. B. Myron Cedarholm was the president of Maranatha Baptist Bible College at that time. And uh, we went into the auditor I went into the auditorium and sat down and immediately is an auditorium that would seat about 800 to 1,000 people. If you packed everybody in and had wall pit chairs down the aisles and everything, you could maybe get 1,000 people in there. And the building was filling up. And Dr. Cedarholm walked up to me and he said, Brother Bottrell, could you come over to my house after the services tonight and have a little bit of fellowship at our house? And I said, well, Brother Cedarholm, I'd love to. That would be an honor. And so I was only 26 years old. So I figured he had invited a whole bunch. There were about 200 preachers there. And I figured he had gone around and invited 50 or 100 other preachers. I said, man, we're going to have us a fellowship over there. After church, I went over to Dr. Cedar Holmes' house. And I thought, where in the world are all the other cars? Nobody else around. So I parked my car and went up to the door, knocked on the door. Thought maybe I was at the wrong house. And... Uh, Dr. Cedarholm answered the door. Well, hello, Brother Bottrell. Come on in. And I went into the living room, and there was Dr. Chelly, a missionary to India that was there. Dr. Cedarholm was there, and his wife was there. Dr. Jack Hiles was there, and Dr. John R. Rice was there. And me. And that's all that was there. And I thought, Lord, what in the world am I doing here with all of these giants of the faith and, and me? Lord, and I'm just a nobody. And about that time, Dr. Uh, Cedar Holmes said, well, let's go into the dining room and have some refreshments. I always wondered what important people ate. You know, and so we went in there. I thought, well, I'm going to see what they eat, you know. And we said, you know, they eat the same stuff we eat. It was amazing. And so we had some fellowship and ate some refreshments. And then we got up. We went into the living room. And Dr. Rice came over and put his hands on my shoulders and led me right over beside the piano that was there. He said, stand right here. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out a piece of sheet music. John R. Rice not only wrote, wrote a lot of books, he wrote a lot of songs. And he said, Sister Cedarholm, would you play this song, please? And she sat down at the piano and started playing a song. And John R. Rice is like three feet from me, looking straight at me. And he says, so little time, the harvest will be over, our reaping done, we reapers taken home, report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest. And I hope he'll smile and that he'll say well done. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. And I uh, stood there and listened. 
I couldn't believe it. John R. Rice, three-fourths of the preachers in America knew him. Very, he, he didn't hardly have to ask for a meeting. People called him for meetings all the time. And uh, I'm in, his, in Dr. Cedar Holmes' house, and he's singing a solo to Roger Bottrell, a nobody. You know, one of the reasons that God used him is because he had some compassion. He cared whether somebody would go to hell or not. He had a heart that was soft for souls. I'll never forget that as long as I live. So many soul winners read the verses of Scripture. And we read one of them like this. He that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. But that is not right. It says, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. One of the best friends that I had in the world when he was alive was Dr. Carlos Demarest. Anybody heard of him? Dr. Carlos Demarest was my soul winning buddy in El Paso, Texas. He and I would go out soul winning at least twice a week when he was in town. And Dr. Demarest had such compassion for souls, we hardly stopped anywhere, anytime that he didn't talk to somebody about Jesus. I'm serious. I'm not exaggerating a bit. We go to the barber shop. I'm sitting in the barber chair getting a haircut, and he's witnessing to all the customers that are waiting. We're from the door to the car. He corrals anybody we happen to be near, talks to them about Jesus. We stop at a gas station. And we don't leave that gas station until he's talked to somebody about Jesus. And every time, every time that I saw him talk to somebody about Jesus, I'd look at him and his eyes were moist. Sometimes a tear running down his cheeks as he would talk to them about Jesus. Dr. Demers, I saw him win a lot of people to Jesus. I wonder why he was so successful in winning people to Christ. He died of Lou Gehrig's disease. I could have given the Lord the names of a few people that I would have rather he taken than Carlos Demarest. You wonder why it happened, but it did. It was amazing when Dr. Rice was singing that song to him, to me, Tears were just running down his face, singing that solo to me. I think one of the reasons that there's not, there's not a person here that wouldn't like to win somebody to Christ, I'm sure. But most of you never will because you don't have a broken heart. You don't really care whether somebody goes to hell or not. Not enough to really care to shed a tear, to weep if God were to, to do that to you. You'd be embarrassed. I remember years ago, I was in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and I just got there, hadn't been there but a week or two, and one of the men in my church came up to me and he said, Brother Bottrell, I have a brother that lives in town. Would you go with me over to his house and help to lead, try to lead him to Christ. And I said, sure, Brother Tally, I'd be glad to do that. And he says, oh, by the way, I need to tell you that the last preacher that was here, I asked him to go see my brother and we went over to see my brother and my brother slammed the door in his face. I says, oh. And so... I said, well, we need to set a date to go. And he said, well, before we do that, I need to tell you that 
the preacher that was before him, I asked him to go see my brother too. And when we got there, my brother slammed the door in his face. And I thought, he just wants to see somebody slam the door in my face. <laughs> and so I said, okay, uh, we said at the time that we were going to go in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, I went to my office and got on my knees and I prayed. I said, God, we're going over to see Mr. Talley's brother. And God, I'm going to try to talk to him about you and try to lead him to you. But, but God, he's just going to slam that door in our face unless you do something. God, you've got to intervene. You've got to do something. And I wept and I prayed. And every day for about two weeks, I prayed. So, oh, God you got to do something or we'll never get the message to him. So the day came. We get in the car and we're headed over to Mr. Talley's house. And uh, on the way over there, I tell Mr. Talley, I said, now listen, I'm going to do all the talking. You just keep your mouth shut. You, you didn't know Mr. Talley, so you knew, I knew I had to say that, you know. And, and so we get there. And it's a quadruplex. There's two apartments on the upstairs and there's two on the downstairs. On the outside of the building, there was a, a wooden fire escape that went up both sides. And that's the way up to, on the left side to Mr. Talley's apartment. We start up the stairs and must, his brother's right behind me. And we're going up to the stairs and get to the top little landing there. And I reach up and just as I start to knock on the door, God did something right then that he had never he'd done it many times since then, but he's never done it before in my life. I reach up to start to knock on the door and all of a sudden God broke my heart. Man, I just started weeping and I couldn't quit. And so Mr. Talley's brother, he opens the door a little bit. He doesn't know who in the world's there. And here's this grown man with tears running down his face, standing at the door. I said, I couldn't hardly even talk. I'm serious. And I said, well, we, we need to talk to you. And he backed up and he said, well, come on in. That's further than anybody else had gotten. And so we got in and went over to the dining room table and sat down. And about 30 minutes later, Mr. Talley's brother trusted Jesus as a Savior. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. How do you get compassion? <coughs> well, you need to look at the Bible and find out what happens to people that aren't saved. You could go to Luke chapter 16 where it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. We'll not read that because you're pretty familiar with it. But read Matthew 25, 41. It says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and 44. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Revelation 20, verse 13, 14 and 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Man, there's gobs of scripture that tells you that people die and they go to hell, a real hell, if they don't know the Lord as their Savior. 
And that ought to touch our hearts and say, oh man, I don't want my uncle going to hell. I don't want my aunt going to hell. I don't want my grandpa going to hell. I don't want my kids going to hell. I don't want that to happen. Oh God, break my heart so I can reach my family for the Lord Jesus. Lord, I don't want my neighbor going to hell. I don't want my co-worker at work going to hell. Oh God, break my heart so I can reach them for the Lord Jesus Christ. We get, need to get to the place to where when God tells you to do something that you obey and we obey it <clears throat> with the Holy Spirit's leading. I don't have time tonight, but for the last long period of time, several years, I pray almost every day, Lord, would you lead me to somebody that's looking for you? Lord, I don't know who in the world's looking for you, but you know, would you lead them to me or lead me to them? And God, I'll try to be very sensitive to your Holy Spirit and talk to the ones that you point out. And I don't have time, but I could give you illustration after illustration of me driving down the road. And God said, stop there at that house. I mean, I've gone by hundreds of houses and no, he didn't say nothing. But all of a sudden he speaks to my heart real heavy in my heart and said, that house right there, stop there. And I pulled a car off and go up to the door and I say, ma'am, I'm a preacher. Now, by the way, if you're not a preacher, you couldn't say that part, of course, if you were out trying to win somebody. But I say, I'm a preacher. And I was driving by this house a minute ago and the Holy Spirit of God told me to stop here. Let me ask you something. Are you having problems? And I've had them, many, many, many of them just break down bawling right then because they have so many burdens that they're carrying and lead somebody to Christ right at the door. The one that's on my mind that I'm telling you about right now, I went back later and led her husband to Christ. And, uh, and folks, it's because the Holy Spirit said, Stop and talk to that person. It's happened in a crowd of people. It's happened in a mall. It's happened in RV parks where I parked my RV. And God said, hey, go over and talk to that guy. Down in, I was in Quincy, Illinois, speaking at Gary Zdarsky's uh, church there. And I uh, had my RV in this RV park. And God said, go talk to that guy in the third trailer from you on the right there. Go talk to him. Never had met him before. And it was already dark outside. There weren't any lights and street lights. Or it was dark. And so I walked up and said, howdy, partner. Went up there and talked to him. And I've got a picture on my phone of him. And he got saved in about 20 minutes there, standing in front of his RV. How come? Because God told me to go talk to him. God already had him ready. God had him all prepared. Spurgeon said, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap into hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. We need to be concerned about lost people. We need to care whether they go to hell or not. I think many times... We look on the outward appearance rather than the heart. I was uh, in El Paso, Texas, and we were going to go soul winning that day. Is it bad to be down here when I'm online? Okay. And uh, so we had about 25 people going soul winning that, that morning, and, and I split them all up two by twos. And I said, hey, we're going to do it different today. We're going to go out, and I want you to stop and talk to the first person that you see. And so got that drilled into them and then I split them up and everybody went out two by two and there was one teenage boy that was left and that's who went with me. And so we got in my car and started down the road and I made a left and made a right and then turned, turned two or three corners. And all of a sudden I turn a corner and there's a guy about three fourths of the block down the, to the, the road there on the right and it looks like he's the president of the Hells Angels. I mean, that guy is a great big burly guy. 
I mean, he's got on one of these T-shirts that you could see through the T-shirt, you know. He had tattoos from his neck to, his, uh, to all that I could see. You know, I don't know how many others he had, but he had them down from it to his waist on up, you know, and so on. And, and uh, he had a little long hair that was down past his shoulders, and he had a beard and everything. And, and uh, I thought, man, that guy, he's going to pull out a gun and shoot us if we just stop our car. And so I said, Lord, don't let my teenage guy see this one. Because I told everybody, stop the first person you see. And he says, hey, there's a guy right there. I thought, oh, man. You know, I said, well, Lord, I'm sure glad I'm saved. I'll be heading to heaven here pretty quick. And uh, so I stopped the car and, and uh, get out of the car. And I say, howdy, partner. And he turns around. And you know what he was? A great, big, giant teddy bear. Soft-spoken, nice guy, really. Had no problem giving him the gospel, no problem talking to him. You know what? I looked on the outward appearance rather than the heart. When I went to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, when I was 22 years old, there was a guy called me on the telephone just to Oh, a few weeks after I got there. He said, hey, this is Larry Stringfield. You don't know me, but I'm going to go as a missionary to Africa. But I can't go out on dep uh, deputation and raise support until I work in a church for one year. Could I come and work in your church for one year? Won't he, I'll, you don't even have to pay me nothing. I thought, well, the price is right. <laughs> and... Uh, so anyway, when we got done our conversation, I said, Larry, come on up. You can, you can come to our church and work here for a year. So he came up and we took care of him and so on. And after a year was over, Larry said, okay, I've been here a year. I'm going to go to Arizona and get married. And then I'm going to go out and raise my support. Then I'm going to Africa. The only problem is Larry had a couple of problems, Brother Dunbar. One... He was heavy. No, he wasn't heavy. He was fat. He was pretty fat. And he went to Arizona and he married a lady that was the same size as he was. And uh, he had another problem. He was going to Africa and he was afraid of bugs. I mean, if he would see a mouse or... <laughs> You know, I mean, really, that was his reaction when he would see a bug or a spider or something. Now, you're going to go to Africa? It's filled with bugs, you know. And uh, I said, nah, you're not going to do nothing in Africa. And so he went and he got married and he went out. And I, I thought, it's going to take him four years to raise his support. Because most of them are not going to support him because they're too heavy. There's too many negatives going for him. And it did. It took him four years to raise his support. Then he went to Africa. And so then he's there four years. I figured he'd be there a month or two, see enough bugs that he'd come back to America and say, I'm not going over there. That's, not, I'm not, that's beyond me. I'm not going to do that. And it'd be a waste of all that missions money that everybody invested. So I didn't support him from our church. And so he came back from Africa and he calls me on the phone. He said, Brother Bottrell, could I come by and give you a report on what I've been doing the last four years in Africa? I said, sure, Larry, come on by. I thought this was going to be fun. And so he comes by and has all set up to show his slides. They didn't have DVDs like they do now. They had slides back then. Some of you older folks remember that, that they did. And I sat down in the seat over on this side of the church and sat up. And he started those slides and I just wept through all of them. Had pictures of him baptizing his converts in creeks that were infested with black bomba snakes, the most poisonous snake in Africa. And he's baptizing people in there. Laying cornerstones to new buildings and... His first tour over there to Africa, he started four churches. I mean, skinny people don't start four churches in one. I mean, I couldn't believe it. 
And I just sat there and wept. And God said, you were looking on the outward appearance, not on the heart. You should have looked at his heart. And if I had looked at his heart, I'd have supported him. He loved people. He had a heart for people. And folks, if we would ever get our hearts right, man, you're just getting ready to launch a soul winning program here. Every single person here, you could win somebody to Christ if you would go forth weeping, bearing precious seed. The Bible says, doubtless you would come back with rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. Anyway, uh, You're not going to win your loved ones without compassion. You must have it. And it needs to be coupled with the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. They that sow in tears, the Bible says in Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6, shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You should be soul conscious. Soul conscious. Andrew got burdened about his brother Peter. Peter was a temper tantrum waiting to happen. Peter had problems in his life. But Andrew loved his brother. I don't know how he led his brother to come to Jesus. But I bet you that he had some tears involved in it. I bet he did. Philip, God told him, hey, Philip, go down to the way that goes toward Gaza. Now, we think about it that we thought God told him to go to Gaza. I don't know whether he ever got to Gaza or not. The Bible doesn't say, as far as I can tell. However, he gets there to the edge of the desert and he looks over there and he sees a guy in a chariot long distance away. And God says, go over there and talk to that guy in that chariot. Go join yourself to that chariot. The Holy Spirit of God told him to. So he ran over there to that chariot and he saw that he was reading in the Bible. He couldn't tell it from the distance where he was what the guy was doing. But he ran over there and saw that he was reading in the Bible. And he said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Some, some man should guide me. And so he hopped up in the chariot and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And led that Ethiopian eunuch to Christ. And he probably, when we get to heaven, we'll find that he went to Ethiopia and started the First Baptist Church of Ethiopia somewhere. You know... Peter led Cornelius and his family to Christ. Paul led Lydia, the Philippian jailer, Timothy, and multitudes of others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus led the woman at the well that we read about to start the message tonight. And Nicodemus and Zacchaeus, the little guy up in the tree, and, and led him to Christ. And multitudes of others. But um, I remember... I preached a revival in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and God really blessed, and we had souls saved, and we had uh, people at the altar, and God was really blessing them, the, the revival, and the revival's over now, and I'm headed out of town, but I get on the, on the thruway, Interstate 43, you know, what, you're, you know that one, and I'm headed down south, and the RV will only get up to about 30 miles an hour, maybe 35 at the most. And it's because the fuel filter was all stopped up. And I knew that because it had happened before. So I thought, well, I'll baby it till I get to Sheboygan and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, put a new fuel filter on. I had one in the trailer I was pulling. So I pull in there <clears throat> and I didn't even have soul winning on my mind at the moment. I should have, but didn't. And there's lights, there was lights at this uh, gas station, but it's two o'clock in the morning and there wasn't anybody else there, just the lady that was taking care of the things on the inside. I went in and told her what I was doing. She said, okay, and I went out to do it. And while I'm changing this fuel filter, 
here comes a guy at two o'clock in the morning pushing a motor scooter, not a motorcycle, but a motor scooter across the parking lot toward me. And God kind of knocked on my heart right then and says, hey, there's one right there. You can get him. And so he pushes over. He says, hey, can you give me a jump? My motor scooter won't start. And I said, sure, as soon as I can get done with putting this uh, fuel filter on there, I'll give you a jump. So I finish it up, wash my hands off, begin to talk to this young man, have a picture of him on my cell phone too. About 20, 30 minutes later, he bows his head at about 2.30 in the morning and prays and asks Jesus to save his soul. And uh, wonderful thing, but I go over there to start his motor scooter and I shake it back and forth in a second. Then I hit the key and it starts right up. Didn't have to jump it. What happened to it? God fixed it so it wouldn't start so that he'd come over and talk to me. That's what happened. And folks, they're all over the place. All you got to do is have your eyes open and your heart open. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. When I was growing up in, in um, Brunswick, Missouri, I had a preacher. His name was Carl Ryther. He was a Southern Baptist preacher, but he was a soul winner. He was a good preacher. There used to be, there, I don't know where there are any today, but there was a good, back then there were some good ones, uh, Southern Baptist preachers. And anyway, um, and he went as a missionary to Pakistan later, but he, he, about every week he would call me on the phone and say, hey, Roger, would you go soul winning with me? I was only like 13 or something like that. Well, okay. I didn't really want to go with him, but I hadn't learned how to say no. And so he would come by and pick me up and we'd go soul winning. And he took me out. Hey, today we're going to go out and see Jimmy Swan's family. Jimmy Swan was a classmate of mine. He wasn't saved and neither was his family. And so we went out to his house and went up the door, knocked on the door, and Mrs. Swan answered the door and talked to her a little bit. And Carl Ryther, my preacher, he said, well, where's your husband? And she said, well, he's out in the barn, but you better not go see him. And he said, well, I'll go out there and I'll just visit with him a minute. That, that won't be, it'll be all right. So we started out to the barn and I'm following him. We get to the barn, we go in the barn and, and Mr. Swan is scooping manure mixed with hay into a trailer. And so Carl Ryther, my preacher, starts talking to him about the Lord. And he gets a few sentences into his presentation. And Mr. Swan says, that's enough. You all can leave now. And my preacher must not have heard him. He didn't pay any attention. He just kept talking to him. And Jimmy Swan's dad takes that manure covered pitchfork and stabs my preacher in the stomach. pierced his stomach and he's bleeding, but he didn't move an inch. I was thinking, it's time to leave. Let's get out of here. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he says a couple more sentences and then we turn around and we leave and we get in the car. We're on our way back to town. And he says, now we're going to stop so I can get patched up at the, in town, but don't you tell anybody that this happened. Because if you tell anybody, people will make fun of Jimmy Swan and we'll never be able to win Jimmy Swan to Christ. So keep your mouth shut. I said, okay. So I did until, you know, I'm telling you, so don't you tell them. <laughs> so, so we get to town and he goes, stops at one of these little emergency places and gets all patched up and gets a tetanus shot. I don't know how deep those prongs of the pitchfork went into him, but there was a preacher of mine that was willing to die to get the gospel to somebody. I thought, wow, what a preacher. What a man of God that would do that for a lost soul. 
But we, it'll never happen to us because we're afraid to even knock on a door. Afraid they might say, no, I don't want a tract. That's our persecution. Oh, no, I went to a house and they said they didn't want a tract. I don't know, I'm not going anymore. You idiot. Any salesman that's ever sold anything has had people tell them no. It happens. We've had people to even be a little bit unkind. But man, we need to understand that, hey, when you're out telling people about Jesus, some are going to love it, some aren't going to like it too much. My mother-in-law passed away. She was 95, about a year and a half ago. And so my wife and I, we had to go down to Arkansas, where she lived, in Pocahontas, Arkansas, in order to get her house all cleaned up and do some repairs on it and empty it out of all of her things and stuff like that so we could sell her house. So we went down there to do that. And I believe in living for the Lord wherever you happen to be, whether it be here or whether it be in Pocahontas, Arkansas or any place else. And so there was a little bitty Baptist church there that had about three people attending it. And so my wife and I, we went there and then I asked the preacher, I said, hey, would you like to grow? And he says, oh, yeah, we'd like to grow. And I said, do you know how to get that to happen? He says, well, how? I said, uh, be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and I'll show you. And so he came the next morning at 10 o'clock. I picked him up and we went soul winning. I said, you know anybody that knows Jesus? I said, listen, I know somebody that does because I'd been in a furniture store. And this, this is one of those furniture stores that rent furniture. I think that's the stupidest thing in the world to rent furniture and pay three times what you would normally pay for a piece of furniture, renting the stupid piece of furniture. But I was in the store just looking around and uh, there was a salesman standing way across the store. Way, there were five or six of them in there, but this guy was standing over there and the Holy Spirit said, go talk to that guy in the corner. Okay. So I went over there and started talking to the guy in the corner. And he was on duty, of course, and I couldn't take 20 or 30 minutes of his time when he's supposed to be selling furniture and things like that or renting furniture. And uh, uh, so I got his address. He gave me his address. And uh, so I had it. And so I said, well, preacher, I've got an address we could go to. And so we went by David Schneider was his name, went by David Schneider's house. David Schneider wasn't home, but his son Eric was home. And he was about 15 years old, and so we went in, and about 20 or 30 minutes later, Eric got saved. Praise the Lord. And so we left, and we uh, went to a couple other houses, and we led another lady and her 12-year-old son to Christ. And so then I said, now, preacher, this is how you do it. And then you follow up these people that you lead to Christ and get them in church. Go by and pick them up on Sunday, bring them to church or whatever you got to do to get them there and, and baby them and help them to grow so that you can get them in church and so on. That's how you, that's how you do it. And so showed him how to do it. And then, then uh, uh, I went back to the house there and working on getting everything cleaned up and all this kind of thing. And it got to the last day that the house had sold and I had to get it all cleaned out that day. My wife and I got up about 5.30 in the morning and we worked till all day long until up in dark. And uh, we were tired. We were done. But I had the RV there and we had the trailer behind the RV that we usually put my car in, but it was full of grandma's stuff. And so my wife was driving the car and I was driving the RV and we're all done, but we're so tired. We're going to drive the RV to some place so we can just pull off the road and go to bed and go to sleep. So we, I get in the RV and we've got two little two way radios that we can talk to each other. And I start down the road and the Holy Spirit says to me, so you're going to let Mr. Snyder and his family go to hell. You'll probably never be back to Pocahontas again. Don't you care about that family? And I was tired, really. I was trying to talk myself out of it. Finally, I got the radio and said, sweetheart, pull into the parking lot here or follow me into the parking lot. So I pulled in the parking lot and stopped and 
I said, sweetheart, you all wait in the RV. I've got to go see this family. So I go over to David Schneider's house, knock on the door, and guess what? They're all home. And I go in, and David Schneider's wife, five years before that, got killed in a car wreck. And so he was a single dad with four kids in the house. He had three others that were grown and married already. So I go in and sit down, and dad gets saved. All three of the other kids get saved. I have a picture of them on my phone, too. And man, they're sitting there with great big smiles on their face after they trusted the Lord as their Savior. How come those guys got saved? Because I was in a furniture rental store and God said, go talk to that guy over there. And I obeyed the Lord and he got saved and all his kids got saved. That's why it happened. Just listening to God, pay attention to the Lord. Paying attention to God. Do you know the, the Bible says uh, Jesus wept in John eleven thirty five. 35. But I don't believe that's the only place that he wept. I believe there's a lot written. I mean, a lot happened that wasn't written in the Bible. But Jesus one time was up on a hill and he says, Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I don't think he was saying it with a smile on his face. I think he was broken hearted. Thou that killest the prophets. And stonest them which are sent unto thee. How oft would I have gathered thee together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. I believe he wept a lot. He might even be weeping tonight in heaven, looking at Christians that are too backslidden to go soul winning, too backslidden to get close enough to God where they can weep. For a lost soul. I'll close with this. In Lyons, New York, where I used to pastor at 14 years, we had a man that came to my church on a New Year's Eve. His name was Greg Heidenreich. You probably met him. And he uh, said he's looking for a good church. He was going to a liberal church out of town in another town and looking for a good church. And he said, you have services tonight? It's Christmas Eve. I said, no, we had services last night. I said, but you can come Sunday. And he came Sunday and loved our church and became a part of it. He's still a part of it over there. Later on, after he, him and his wife got in our church, his mother lived and his dad lived about a mile from our church. And I got burdened. God laid there that family on my heart. And I said, man, Martha needs to be saved. So, and you know, Martha was Greg's wife, a mother, I mean, she was a member of Menza. Anybody know what Menza is? Menza? Menza is an organization that you can only belong to it if you're really, really smart. I'm too dumb to belong to it. But maybe some of you might qualify if you try it out for it and so on. But I mean, you've got to have an IQ of 140, 50 or 60, something like that, just to belong to Menza. And she was a member of it. And so I went to see her and I said, Martha, why don't you come and visit our church? Your son goes to our church and, and uh, your son's wife goes to our church and so on. Br bring your husband and come on to our church. And well, okay, I can come. So she started coming to our church. And, uh, I dealt with her about the Lord, but she said, no, I, I'm not going to get saved. And she comes to our church about six weeks in a row, five or six weeks. I didn't count them for sure. And then after church, one Sunday morning, she came up to me right after church, Brother Dunbar, and she says, preacher, I just want you to know I'm not coming back. I said, what? That's like stabbing a preacher in the, in the, in the stomach with something, you know? I mean, broke my heart. I said, why? Why aren't you coming back? She said, preacher, I don't believe this stuff. I don't believe it. I'm not coming back. And so she goes home. Her and her husband go home. And about two weeks later, God laid him on my heart and told God says, go down there and visit Martha Heidenreich again. 
Okay. And so I go down and knock on Martha Hardenreich's door. She comes to the door and says, what in the world are you doing here? I told you I wasn't coming back to church. I said, well, you know how women are. They change their mind all the time. I, I just thought, you, you know, and so she sort of half laughed and said, no, I didn't change my mind. I'm not coming back. And so I left and a couple of weeks later, God laid her on my heart again, said, get down there and see Martha Heidenreck again. I said, well, okay. I go down and knock on her door. She comes to the door and says, preacher, what in the world are you doing here? I said, I came to see if you'd come back to church some, you know, and, and she said, no, I told you I don't believe that stuff. I'm not coming back to church. And it happened over and over again. Every couple of weeks, God would lay her on my heart. And, and I'd been to her house now five or six, seven times. I don't remember how many exactly after, uh, you know, every couple of weeks. And uh, so then she had a garage out there inside her house and it had a dirt floor in it and she wanted concrete in it. So she called me on the phone and said, Preacher, I'm going to pour some concrete in this garage and I don't have anybody that could screech the, the concrete out and to smooth the concrete out and so on. Could you find somebody to do it and I'll pay him? I said, okay, when are you going to do it? And so she told me when she was going to do it. And so I found somebody to help me. And so I and the, my buddy, we went down there and we did it for her. And they poured the concrete. We screeded it all out, made her garage real nice and we get all done, she reaches in her purse, pulls out a couple of hundred dollar bills and tries to pay me one. And I said, Martha, I don't want no money. I'm just doing this because I love you. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing this for money. And so she said, tried to give it to my buddy there that helped me. He says, if the preacher's not taking any money, I'm not taking any money. I didn't say nothing at all to him. And she said, well, surely maybe there's something I could do for you guys for helping and doing all this work. Oh, I just thought of something. You could come back to church a few times. Well, I guess I could do that. And so she started coming back to church. About two or three weeks after she started coming back to church, she had been to the doctor and the doctor told her that she had cancer. Fourth stage, Martha, there's not anything really we could do. You're going to die. And so she's in the hospital, and I went to see her in the hospital. No, preacher, I told you I'm not interested. And then I had a revival down at, um, in Brogue, Pennsylvania at Brother Randy Starr's church. So I left town to go down and I preached the revival for Randy Starr and got done. And my wife and I are traveling back. And all the way back, she's on my heart. And I'm praying for her and weeping for her. And, and God says, go by the hospital to see her. And so I went by the hospital to see her. And I said, Martha, why don't you break down and just get saved? Talk to you about it a dozen times or more. You know how to do it. Why don't you just break down and do it? She says, oh, no, not today. I'm not doing that. So I went home. One day had passed. It was the next evening. It was after 8 o'clock, and visiting hours closed about 8 o'clock at the hospitals. And, but a preacher can get in anyway, because we own the place, you know. <laughs> and so, so we, I went to the hospital and went in through the emergency and went into went into her room and went up to her and looked down at her and I said, Martha, why don't you just give up and let God save you? And she looked up at me and says, okay. And I couldn't believe it. I dealt with her so many times. And a few minutes later, she bowed her head and prayed, said, Jesus, I've said no so many times, but this time I really mean it. Would you come into my heart and forgive me of my sin and come into my heart and save my soul and give me eternal life, Lord? And she finishes her prayer. And then she looks up at me and she says, Woo! I don't know why I didn't do this a long time ago. And I says, I don't either. It would have saved me a lot of work. 
Anyway, and you say, well, you think she really got saved? Well, a couple of days later, I went to the hospital to see her. And she said, hey, preacher, a couple of weeks ago, you announced in church that you were trying to raise some money to buy a paper cutter for the, for the uh, Bible assembly ministry. And what did you say that cost? I says, about $3,000. And she says, give me my checkbook out of the drawer right there. And she wrote me a check for $3,000 for the paper cutter. I thought, whoa, that's putting some action to your salvation experience. And she paid for the paper cutter. And she was so happy the last couple of weeks of her life, and then she died. And uh, we had the funeral. And we, at the same time, we rejoiced because she was in heaven. And uh, her son came up to me after the services and said, Mama made me promise that I would give you this after the funeral. She, he gave me an envelope and I looked in it. There was $1,000 in the envelope. Pays to go soul winning. Let me just tell you something. There's not anything this side of heaven that gives you more joy than leading somebody to Christ. And it's almost like getting saved again. Now that's the best thing that ever happened to you. You got saved. But you could win somebody to Christ if you really, really wanted to. You could do it. He that goeth forth and weepeth. Unless God's a liar. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Could we have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed? Lord Jesus, I've tried to impress upon the dear people at Freedom Baptist Church tonight the importance of telling somebody about Jesus and winning somebody to you. Lord, I ask you, please, to do what I cannot do. And I pray that you already have spoken to hearts. There's people here, I'm sure, that have never led a soul to Christ, but they would like to. And Lord, we've shown them from the Word of God how they can do it. I pray that you would help people to get the fever of wanting to win somebody to you so bad that they would be willing to weep to get somebody saved. Lord, do we care enough to weep? I pray, Lord, that you would meet spiritual needs tonight. Lord, if somebody needs to get saved, help them to come to this altar and take the preacher's hand and say, I'd like to get saved. And Lord, we'll do our best to show them how they can get born again by the blood of Christ. Lord, there's others that need to come to this altar and pray and say, oh God, Break my heart for souls. Help me, Lord, to do something to reach somebody for Thee. Oh, God, would You cause people to be obedient to the Holy Spirit tonight. Let's all stand where we are. And as the pianist plays, God, speak into your heart. Slip out of your seat and come to this altar and pray. Take care of business with God. You do what God wants you to do.